Okay, good morning. Um, firstly, I know um, it, it starts, it said Samuel Awanuga at the start, but I, we also have our lovely partner, Domino Data. Um, so Stephen, who can um, introduce himself first. Hi, Stephen Cahoon, partner of uh, VMware here from Domino Data. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, AI and machine learning. Yeah, and um, for me, I am Sam. I am working in VMware. I initially was a researcher from the University of Surrey in distributed systems, and then I joined in our industry solutions team, where we work with partners like Domino to create solutions for customers. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead. So firstly, I'll quickly go over the agenda and what we're here to talk about, and then we'll go and dive straight in. And if there's any questions, you know, feel free to just jump in and ask us. So first, we'll quick an overview um, from what AI and ML is and why is it important. And it's great we have a um, you know data science platform partner with us to really you know give a different perspective um, on the sort of workloads that run on VMware that are AI ML led. And then we'll go a bit in the headwinds of ML ops. So ML ops um, machine learning for operations. Um, like what headwinds are typically faced and that disparities between some of the IT and data folks. And then we'll go a bit into what is actually MLOps and how can it help um, businesses, data scientists, and IT infrastructure? So really the different personas. Um, and we'll go into actually the why of VMware, because I know most people you know, will re recognize VMware from the IT infrastructure systems perspective. Um, so it's like, what is that connection um, that bridges the two together? And, and why should that we be cognizant of that? And then we'll go into our integrated solution with um, our partner Domino Data. And then we'll just end round off. So without further ado, I will hand over to Stephen. Yeah, so we start with a nice uh, marketing slide. So obviously it looks very impressive. Uh, and it's, it's really talking about everything that's going to be model driven moving forwards. And there's lots of different taglines like this around that say, you know, if you're not going down the AI and ML route, you know, your business is going to be dead. There's lots of scaremongering. But I think the world is kind of coming around to the idea that this can really help and you can get some value from it. So what is machine learning? Um, does anyone know the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? No? So artificial intelligence is really the software, whereas machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, and it's really the algorithms. And when we say the algorithms, we're really talking about, uh, in exactly the same way as humans learn, these algorithms learn on training, training on historical data, and then building out these models that can then predict value, predict elements moving forwards. And that's really thousands of different use cases, but that's essentially what machine learning is. Just before you jump onto the next one. Um, the other part that's been in the news a lot recently is around generative AI and machine learning. And this is where quite a lot of the scaremongering is coming in. You know, the likes of, uh, uh, John was just talking about uh, our, our friend Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. And Elon Musk has been out there saying, you know, you only bring in AI reg oh, regulations of anything, but in particular AI regulations when something terrible happens. And in the case of AI on machine learning, if, uh, if something terrible happens, then we'll all be in a whole heap of trouble. So we don't, we don't want that happening. But when it comes to generative AI and machine learning, uh, you'll all have heard of chat, GPT, uh, BARD. There's also some really cool stuff now on creating images and art. So there's lots of different things out there that can really help you do some cool stuff. And I think most organizations now are looking at how they can integrate that into their wider AI and machine learning stack. Next one. So the turning point for AI. So this, this comes from uh, a McKinsey study in terms of enterprises are heavily investing in AI. Just out of interest, in, in the audience, are you aware of your organizations investing in AI, in MLOps, and machine learning platforms? Is, is anyone's company not doing that? Is that of interest? Yeah? OK, so it's, it, it's still interesting to see. But 79% see significant cost savings, and 67% see an increase in revenue, which is massive, really. 
So, I mean, if you can get the right use case and you can get the right machine learning model, there's some big savings to be had here. These were taken from an IDC survey. Uh, and, and it's very interesting that even the guys that are out there testing, doing lots of these different things, and I'd, I'd put it back to uh, when the Hadoop Lake came about. Everybody wanted a Hadoop Lake. There was lots of testing and lots of playing with it. Then nobody really got any value from it. And it was kind of pushed to the side and under the carpet. And everyone went, oh, cloud, this is the new big thing. Big difference with machine learning is we are starting now to get a lot of these models into production. And the business is seeing value from them. And it's that value and ROI that's really making a big difference. This is also from IDC. So uh, one of the key elements that came out was that by 2024, 60% of enterprises will operationalize ML workflows through MLOps. And we'll get into a little bit about what MLOps actually is. Next. OK, and, um, and let's be honest. I think AI and ML is a big trend right now in terms of you know, some people may see it as possible, some people may go really into it. There are very you know, degrees as to how people may view it. But really and truly, I think a lot of it does start with data. Um, and a lot of times, there's different personas in an organization that deals with different things. And um, from an IT perspective, you know, their focus would be something specific. It's in their domain and systems, et cetera, and IT infrastructure. Whereas there'll be a very different personas that will deal with these sorts of technologies and AI, ML workloads, or data science. So um, here we actually just kind of look at the, the business struggles between sometimes we have, um, and we may see in our organizations, we would have a silo team that is dealing with you know, the data science and um, all, of the, all of that um, workflows from the data models but a different type of team that's dealing with the IT operations and infrastructure. And that can be a struggle because you have different personas focused on different things. So from a data science perspective, they're not necessarily always concerned about the infrastructure it's running on, et cetera. They just want to develop their models, to train their models, and put it to production quickly and, and, and scale it. So they're more focused on that sort of orchestration, whereas an IT um, operator would have a different focus. They want, um, they want to focus on systems management, on compliance, disaster recovery, kind of the, the bare bones to make sure that the infrastructure is running and there is no, like, there, there is no, I guess, failures or something. And we, and, and we probably know that any sort of IT infrastructure failure can, can be fatal. And um, that's when every organization wants to then talk to us when, when there's a problem. But, um, that really is a, a struggle if it's siloed because what needs to happen is that the infrastructure needs to be optimized to run these sorts of workloads. And there needs to be an understanding as to what are the requirements for specific workloads that may have particular either regulatory requirements. So in terms of actually if a particular data set or um, scale of workload needs to be stored in a, in a hardened environment or in a particular environment, and they also need to be aware of what are the requirements um, in terms of if, whether it's accelerated computing or whether, what are the hardware requirements to actually run these workloads. So there needs to be smooth communication between the two. And there also needs to be an uh, optimized workflow so that from the whole um, path from whether it's modeling, training, to production um, on IT infrastructure, whether it's on-premise or cloud, is understood by both aspects of the business. So um, bridging those two together um, is a challenge and not being siloed and being cognizant of actually how are these workflows coming together is really important. So if I go in the next slide. And then in this slide, we then kind of go into some of the global data regulations, which some we may be aware of, um, some may be new. But the reason why we bring this up is um, essentially because as data and you know training of data becomes this big thing that everyone wants to do regulations are evolving and where you store how you manage and how you process these data is now a big thing and it's a changing thing it affects you know not even necessarily just data for um, AI ML and uh, machine learning training but also data for all sorts of use so we just kind of touch a bit into some of the emerging data regulations before going into a specific one um, but one, you know, data privacy regulations have seen a big increase globally. We might be aware of some. We might be aware of the incoming EU Data Act, the incoming EU AI Act. Um, I would recommend looking into that because 
where actually these data are stored becomes really important with these incoming regulations and how you manage it is also important. Another thing is um, they vary. Um, <laughs> they vary by country, which can be very, you know, um, can be very cumbersome in many organizations. If you are in the EU, um, they will have these specific um, regulations and they will have particular ways you process it than if you're in the US. So if you now are a global organization and um, you process and store data from across the globe, you now have to be cognizant as to, based on my region, what, what, how do I manage this data? And here we have some examples. Um, so, you know, in, in Australia and Asia Pacific and all of that, um, all of that region, there is a lot of regulations on data and not even just data, resiliency, um, explainability of the AI and also, um, and also just in general sovereignty. So there is a lot of regulations there. And then if we look at, for example, um, a lot of the US organizations that operate globally, they will also have to comply with some of the EU regulations, which tend to obviously be a lot more um, prescriptive in terms of um, how actually data is managed, where the data is stored, and also what extent you can um, you can use and identify personal data. So as this... When is the uh, EU Act, AI Act, coming into force then? Um, I can't remember the actual date, but I know they are still doing consultations. Um, I believe there was like a first revision for, in terms of actually putting a guidance for next year, and then when it's actually, you know, being ratified, I need to confirm that. But I'll have a look at the actual... Yeah, the, the EU ones are being drawn up, but uh, the UK government's formed a separate team that's doing the AI regulations for the UK. Uh, we're probably expecting that Q1 next year in terms of what will be coming into place. And a lot of it is based on to this DORA Digital Operational Resiliency Act that uh, I think we'll be leading on to. Yes. And... Um, and if we kind of just touch into, as um, Stephen said, DORA, that's now a big one that is coming. It affects a lot of um, you know, third-party critical providers, so cloud service providers. Um, they're still yet to see the extent as to which third-party IT systems will be classed as critical third parties. so the jury is out. Um, but essentially, just um, any outsourcing that is done with third party would have to comply with this European Union Digital Operational Resiliency Act. So I'm not sure if um, anyone here is familiar with it, but um, the big thing about it and why it's so different to what is existing in place is um, it has rules in terms of how you actually store and manage um, data with third parties, how you actually manage your exit plans with third parties, and also the contractual arrangements you have with third parties. So for example, um, there is heightened risk management. So if you are... a uh, financial services entity um, and you are working with it on a cloud provider, etc. Dora now mandates you to actually have, whether it's um, regular incident reporting, to have a demonstra demonstrable exit strategy. So you actually not even just in your contract say, yes, let's remove this vendor if we need to, but you need to be able to actually show that you can um, technically do it. And that then kind of brings that heightened thing of, um, you know, what are your failover plans? What are your um, data management plans? Are you able to recover data? So these things become critical and they become overlooked. And it's not just you know um, one aspect of the business, it's the whole business that needs to be aware of this. So that's why you know merging those silos um, and them understanding actually there are requirements as to resiliency, there are requirements to how you manage your data, there are requirements as to, um, as to actually cooperating with the different vendors you use is really, really important because then if anything comes up, everyone's aware and on the same page as to how to manage that. So um, I'll go over to the next slide. Go so what is MLOps? Uh, most, most people here have hopefully heard of DevOps in some form or other. So MLOps is kind of DevOps for machine learning. And the, the reason why it's got its own separate category is really because if you take most of the elements within DevOps, you could have a report, you could have a dashboard, a graph, a chart. They're all relatively static on data that's not moving. If we take a machine learning model, that's trained on historical data, but there can be all different elements that come into effect that can affect that model. So that model needs to be constantly tracked and monitored 
when it's in production. And if anything starts to uh, move, if anything starts to change on that model, then we need to send out an alert so that somebody is aware that that isn't necessarily performing as well as it was when we first put it into production. So MLOps is really about how you can help monitor the end-to-end -end life cycle of a machine learning model. Uh, yep, next one. So it's also very much around uh, accelerating data science and scaling data science. So I've mentioned about the end-to-end -end life cycle, but it's how you get that flexibility to the data scientists. So Sam was talking about the different silos between data scientists and IT operations. An MLOps platform really helps to kind of allow those data scientists to use the tooling that they require to build out the machine learning models, but also have access to the uh, infrastructure that they require to actually build out some of these. And if that's going to take one week, two weeks, they're, they're wasting their time. So if a data science team's got a pipeline of 30 models that they're looking to build, and it could be anything from churn, marketing and sales models, credit risk in finance, you know, healthcare's looking at some really cool stuff like uh, pattern matching to look at certain diseases or cancer and those kind of things. There's a lot of value that you can get from it, but only really if you can control it, break down these silos and allow the data science teams to actually get those in production. And we saw from that earlier slide with the IDC uh, uh, survey that was done, that only 31% of these models are getting into production. So even though there's a lot of value behind it, there's a lot of blockers to getting them out there. So what you really want is a sort of CRM system for your machine learning models, a kind of system of record that helps you manage, develop, deploy, and monitor these, and do that at enterprise scale, but whilst making sure that we cover off everything for AI regulations in terms of governance, monitoring, and seeing where those are. Next slide, please, Sam. So the Domino uh, Enterprise MLOps platform is very much that. It is this system of record. But what we do is we allow you to access any, any software data, any of the languages. You tend to find that with data scientists, they all have a preferred language. I don't know if we have any data scientists in the room. I'm not, not expecting it with this audience, but uh, they tend to be, uh, you know, like, like uh, modeling in R or Python. Some are still using SAS and these other tools. But what we allow them to do is collaborate on the same machine learning model with whatever tool that they want to use. So that can help to speed up the process and scale that machine learning model. Um, but also allow everything to be monitored within the platform at the same time. Then it comes to the infrastructure, and we'll come on to this a little bit more, but by making sure that those machine learning models are running in the right infrastructure, be that on-prem, on-cloud for certain models, then we can make sure that we're uh, keeping costs as low as possible for some of these heavier, larger language models that, that take a lot of uh, build. So it's open and flexible, built for teams and integrated workflows that help, but it's very much around, because you've got this system of record, it's about creating reusable assets. So a large part of data science work really is the upfront data engineering, pulling all of that together. If you've got a platform where people can go and see, if you like, a, a starter for 10 around a churn model that they can take and then manipulate within their organization, and they may save themselves 50, 60, 70% of that upfront work time, that's where you can really scale getting these models into production. So VMware and Domino, uh, but why? And this is really around, just as I was starting to touch on, where you've got these different use cases, some will be better run on-prem. And it's, it's interesting that the organizations that we're talking to now are kind of, they've been through that wow cloud moment, everything should be put in the cloud. It's now like, oh, actually, that's really quite expensive. <laughs> and actually, it's not very easy to move from AWS to Google to Azure. And if I do try and do that, it's going to be complex and costly internally, so I'm stuck with AWS. They're charging me more and more, and you're in this vicious circle. So 
a lot of companies now are saying, well, for certain models, let's move them back on-prem, because actually that's going to be a more cost-effective way of doing it. So by working with VMware and working within the platform, we can work out where these models are best to be put, which then reduces that compute spend. And this is why we're really getting now the, the ear of the chief data officer, the chief technical officer, the CIO, because everyone is now about reducing cost. Predicting the data sovereignty very much around uh, those regulations that Sam was talking about earlier in terms of uh, whether it's GDPR, whether it's about, you know, you've got sensitive data in an investment bank in Zurich that can't be moved. How do you actually build these machine learning models without moving the data? And how do you future-proof those infrastructure systems across the, the hybrid and multi-cloud? Does that all make sense? Yeah. Um, and I think one other thing I would add as well is that data gravity aspect, which um, so essentially is just describing when data sources become so large and so complex, they become harder to move, you know, across different platforms because they're just so large. Um, but I think one thing that both our stories really do well is um, actually enable you to be able to choose the right infrastructure and also move um, it's a bit more seamlessly. Um, obviously, it's a bit more technical than that, but um, in a way that actually um, allows you to accommodate that complexities in data gravity. But yeah. Okay, so we have stack. <laughs> you want to go over the first part and then... And then yeah, sure. Down. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll come into this in a bit more detail, but... But effectively, you know, we're the enterprise MLOps at the top. Depending on if you're wanting to run some complex models using NVIDIA, then that fits very nicely in the stack to scale. It's all on a Kubernetes uh, container platform and built on the VMware Cloud Foundation. Um, in terms of the data scientists, this allows them to really access any of those clouds and infrastructure that they need to. So it makes it very easy from that point of view. And then the other side is from the IT platform operators and how they can manage in the background the costs, manage who's allowed to use your, what, what teams, can they actually uh, pull together some, some test configurations and, and run a quick test to see if there's some signal in the data. So it, it's again, this, this stack is really about breaking down those silos between the data scientists and the IT platform uh, operators by having a fully integrated stack. And just, just on that, if you're not an NVIDIA user, hopefully there's no NVIDIA in the room, you don't have to have that part of it. Uh, a lot of customers out there might just be running uh, Kubernetes, VMware, and, uh, and, and Domino. Yeah, and um, I think on the, so on the IT infrastructure side as well, you know, it's classic VCF. But um, the great thing is that, one, there's accelerated workloads, so um, really allowing you to share and manage GPU if you, if you need, need an accelerated workload. As I said, it's not all customers um, that use so. Um, and another thing as well is some of those like classic VMware um, solutions as here actually really works nicely um, when we're thinking about data workload placement. So um, in terms of whether it's vMotion or DRS, really allowing you to, whether it's do load balancing um, or migrating VMs from one host to another if you require more compute or if you um, require less compute for the volume of data. So there is those really nice VMware solutions that integrate and have a good use case for those sort of um, requirements that, you know, that may vary based on the workload needs for your data platforms. So I think that um, is interesting. And I know we also put Kubernetes. Typically, we get asked, is that Tanzu only? Um, the answer is it's not Tanzu only. Um, it can run an OpenShift or any other conformat Kubernetes. Obviously, we like Tanzu. But um, it's, it's really up to the customer to, to, to choose what, what um, Kubernetes distro they would like to use. But um, yeah, that is the next one. Okay, um, so again, here we'll talk about kind of like the powerful benefits of MLOps. And um, we, I hope now we see it not just as a silo, okay, those are the ML data teams that they do their stuff, you go do you. And then these are the IT teams, you know, you do your stuff. But we now see is actually we need to understand what are the requirements of both and accommodate to, to each based on your, um, based on your needs. 
And um, the benefits I think we see is really one for, um, especially on the dominant platform, the benefits for data science in terms of that kind of self-service um, tool in is really important. So you can really kind of be able to choose your preferred infrastructure um, that you need to run a particular um, workload and to deploy your models faster. I think another key one is um, really, if you're able to publish your models faster, that actually affects your business because then you can act quicker and you can also, you know, gain more results a lot faster than if you had to kind of have a slower pipeline between your model training to deployment. So that speed and ease of process is really important for businesses and data scientists. Another thing as well is, you know, we previously touched on regulations. But that kind of ability to um, reproduce, understand your models, publish your models, and know the infrastructure is running speaks to the aspect of explainability. So I don't know if anyone's heard of explainable AI. Um, it's another key discussion that's being talked about. So it's really about do you understand you know, your models? Um, so if you, if you put um, I don't know, a query on whether it's whatever generative AI, and that's just a, an example, um, and it gives you a random a random answer. I don't know if anyone's heard of, you know, hallucination in um, in these models. But really, if it gives you a random answer and you're not able to explain it, and you know, a regulator comes and says, "Where did you get this from?" How are you going to be able to explain it? But explainability of AI is about understanding your results, why it actually came with that results, but also understanding: Do you understand where the data is stored? Do you understand actually what the pipeline is? So it then extends to all those. Um, different things. So with both platforms, with Domino and VMware, um, and also all the other infrastructure um, that you know, it can run on, is that you're able to understand actually your models, you're able to understand where your models are running, and you're also able to demonstrate that actually we're, we're being resilient and we're doing our due diligence to actually um, create an end-to-end -end cycle from explaining the AI models to ensuring that it's running safely and you know, protected. And from that explainability piece, one of the other key things for the what, what we're calling the data science leaders here. Now, these can be your CDAOs, your CIOs, it can be your, your IT leaders, but it's very much around who's worked on a particular model, where have they got that data from, what version are they currently running. If something happens in terms of that data, which was the last model that was working well, can we switch back to that? So all of these different elements are not only something that you need to be able to show to the regulator how you're doing it, but to be able to run your business and make sure those models are still performing and, and you're getting maximum value from them. Yeah, and, um, and that's a really important point as well. And also if like even the for IT operations as well, um, what are the benefits there? So in terms of actually being able to manage um, the compute resources and understand what are the compute requirements based on you know what your data science leaders or data science teams um, require and being able to actually accommodate that is really, really important. Um, and also as governance as well and actually supporting data science is really important. Um, so with IT infrastructure, many things run on VMware platforms or other you know, cloud platforms, but actually being able to say these are the specific requirements um, for our huge data workloads, or I don't know whether it's small or big, um, and being able to accommodate and ensure that depending on the volume, you're able to be agile enough to actually um, get ready for that. And also being able to be agnostic as well is a key thing in um, Domino. So, Yes, you know, in some particular workloads and, you know, in some customers, you know, they particularly enjoy on-premise for protected workloads, but it may be the case that for another use case, you, you acquire whether it's a different platform and you require that kind of agility to be render agnostic. So that, that combination really is important um, to kind of have that agility based on your different need. Next one. Oh, and benefits to your business. Do we kind of split this um, up? Um, but yeah, I think generally benefits to your business. So we all, or most of us will probably work in companies that um, I know some don't necessarily, um, aren't investing in data scientists um, and some are heavily investing. But the key thing is benefits to your business is one, um, being able to actually have improved efficiency and agility. And we've talked about that in the slides. And we all don't know actually what does that mean, but that really just means faster time to production um, 
and being able to understand your models faster um, and better and knowing the infrastructure that it runs on. So that is really important um, for data science leaders and also um, data science teams. Second one is um, model performance as well. So that is through the monitoring tools um, and also being able to kind of scale up or down based on your different needs as well. So um, and being able to monitor actually what is the particular, you know, what is the performance, what are the requirements, etc. And having that ongoing is really important as well. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you want to touch on or if not. No, I don't. Okay. I think it's good. Okay. And um, yeah, and I think another key thing is also the um, really democratized access to high value hardware. And what does that mean? That means um, if you are particular, you know, running a particular workload and you need access to a particular hardware, accelerated um, compute, etc., you're able to do that um, with with ease, and you're able to kind of know actually based. These are my requirements. These are the, what I need to to run whatever models. Um, and I need access to that. You can tell your IT infrastructure team, and then you can have a streamlined pipeline that allows you to do that and manage that um, a lot better. Um, a key one as well, you know, for, um, as, as I said, we have some customers that run both and particular use on-premise protected workloads. And that is because, you know, there are heightened sometimes security, operation resiliency, um, and data management regulations, especially now that AI is hitting trendy. It's not new, but now it's hip, so everyone wants to regulate it even more. But um, now with all these different um, requirements, a lot of companies may want to say for protected workloads or for particular requirements, we're going to run it on premises and we're going to kind of use our um, hardened environment or ensure that the data is adhering to sovereignty requirements or standards of, of whatever jurisdiction they're in. Um, and with that as well, I think that then kind of extends to some of the, you know, the core the core, you know, VMware solutions. So whether it's um, security, disaster recovery, ransomware um, protection and recovery, like cross cloud services, and that is all based, you know, agnostic to the workload. Well, those are really important also for data um, because data is very, very important, especially if it's personal data. So those things actually become a lot more um, important when we when we are talking about um, um, machine learning and actually, you know. Um, Publishing, pipe, um, publishing models into on-premises. Those key fundamental um, features, which we just kind of, you know, to say is, oh, I don't know, VR, CRM, SRM, sorry. Um, those are actually really important. Um, and also as well, like, you know, the classic, you know, the classic ESG carbon, um, carbon targets are also really important because um, a lot of time, you know, when we're dealing with high levels of data, they can obviously require a lot of compute resources. But one, um, that sort of DRS for resource efficiency and also the classic server consolidation is really important um, as well in terms of actually efficiently um, making use of the compute storage of, of data platforms. But yeah, I think that covers it all here. Yeah, so that pretty much sum, sums it all up. Uh, we're, we're kind of finishing with uh, the integrated MLOps platform gives data scientists what they want uh, and need while keeping them safe, secure and compliant, thus creating better business outcomes with reduced risk. But it really is about allowing these data scientists to access the right tools to be able to get through that pipeline, to get to the right data through this integrated stack, to get those models built and out into production and to scale that and work through that pipeline. Everyone knows that data scientists are in, in short supply, or at least good ones are. Um, so, uh, so you've got to maximize, if you like, the team that you've got. So that's really uh, what we're saying here. And you can do that with the integrated stack between VMware and uh, Domino Data. Okay. So thanks very much. Um, if you've got any questions, reach out to, to Sam or myself, or by, <laughs> by all means, uh, <laughs> ask, ask, them. ask them now. <laughs> So we, we do it in a, a couple of different ways. So we have an on-prem solution, which you can set up 
on-prem and, and manage your costs internally. The platform will help you in terms of what you're doing in the different cloud environments, and that's where it can kind of say that model actually shouldn't be running in the cloud. That would be better run on-prem. Cloud health, say, or uh, Aria charge back or something custom made by you? It, uh, it's not. It, it's purely your own uh, on-prem cost, you know, Anchor, in terms of how we... Yeah, so, uh, so <coughs> I think two things there is, one, the on-prem piece, if you're running it there, with Next specifically, but that's where I think uh, Stephen is going with you know, us. So basically, uh, basically looking at the cost across multiple clouds, and we are, we are giving a recommendation to the, to the data science team as to this is where you run, and you will save a lot on training when you're training your models. So let's say you're AWS, Azure, yeah, uh, yeah, and all your TCO, you, you look at the per hour cost of running um, some image, image classification model, and you will save that money. So we are giving that recommendation in the data. Yeah. Based on that, you can decide whether to run it or get rid of it. And then the second part of that is uh, a lot of customers, depending on size and complexity and what they've got going on internally, don't want to be managing their own infrastructure. So we have an enterprise cloud offering where the platform runs in the cloud, but back to the point that we were talking about earlier, you you uh, go against the separate data planes, so you're not moving the data from VMware or from a cloud solution where it is, so you're saving costs on that, you're also helping with that whole governance, security, and the regulation space. Great, any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, is the AI, uh, you know, a branch of AI, is it foolproof or do you have like a lot of anomalies coming out of this? Can you just be able to explain yourself how oh. the AI works? I think we can both work on that, but um, it's it's not foolproof um, in terms of it is depending on um, I'll say it isn't isn't because it depends on obviously the level of um, training that you give it. So it what the output is is based on the input and based on your models. Um, and you know you could it, hallucination is a thing where in um, the AI space where if you and it, it's a it's if you necessarily ask a question that is maybe really long or you. Um, or something that isn't necessarily tied to how it's been trained, it can give an answer that is different. And that's particularly if you're, you know, a Gen AI use case. In the AI modeling use case, it's huge. So, you know, it could just, it's typically maybe if you're just processing a particular data set, where there when it sets, it's, it's give, it knows what it's doing, the algorithm set, and once you put the data, you get your output. Um, but if you're looking at more prescriptive um, examples where it's like, you know, Gen AI and all these big companies that are trying to do different things, that then is, um, a, a, a mixed answer where it's it the input is the input is kind of just based on what is set and then if you ask a question to whether it's like you know chat gtp or bard or all these different things or all these different ai platforms um that is they're not necessarily familiar with or is not in their training systems it can either hallucinate or it can um, give an answer that is um, that may not be what you're expecting. So that's why it just depends on the models that's being run, depends on the kind of algorithm, and depends on the use case. So that would be my answer. I don't know if yeah, so the only thing that I'd add to that is, uh, you know, the reason why data scientists are paid a lot of money is this is complex stuff. So getting that data set is one thing, but the data engineering and making sure that that is in good shape to actually get a signal off of it, it is very different. And that's why... They have to train the model on the data several times. They then reshape the data. They have different categories that are putting in to see if they can get more signal out of it. You've got all these complex area under curves that you can look at to see how that model is actually performing. And that's how they kind of round it out to make sure that they've got the most performant model possible. OK. What about, sorry, what about yeah, so large language models. Uh, so this would be your, your how you're integrating with chat GPT. So we do integrate directly with chat GPT, and you are looking at how companies can utilize these large language models. 
it's not the sort of thing that you're going to want to be trying to bring on prem yourself because that is a, a great example where you're using huge GPUs to crunch massive amounts of data. So that is one where you want to use companies like OpenAI, ChatGPT, and these kind of elements to build out those models. Um, but yes, yeah, good, good question. Okay. Great. So we're we're around during the the break. So if anyone's got any other questions, please come up to us. It's myself, Sam, and then I've got Anchor and Michael from uh, Domino Data as well. But thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much.